building a better Bay Area for a safe and secure future. This is ABC 7 News. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Liz Croix in for Kristen Z on this Memorial Day. Welcome to our daily special called Getting Answers. We are asking experts your questions every day at 3 o'clock to get answers for you in real time. And today we are looking forward to another great conversation with California Schools Superintendent Tony Thurmond. So we're really looking forward to that. You can post all your questions for him on our Facebook live stream, our YouTube live, or check out our Instagram stories to submit a question. Uh, I know we've gotten a lot of questions so far already from a lot of you. And the things that we're going to be talking uh, with the superintendent about uh, are all the things so many of us want to know the impact particularly on the state budget and how that will impact schools reopening uh, we know in the two weeks since we last had the superintendent here on this show we have gotten that updated budget from the governor and so if approved uh, it could mean cuts to school districts this is a time right now that would be pretty difficult for school districts to have to manage uh, budget cuts given the fact that trying to make a safe and secure school if anything is going to cost more, if you need to have more teachers to be able to have uh, different times and scattered school times, that means more custodians, uh, more security perhaps, or whatever it entails uh, is definitely going to cost more for these schools and also maybe more uh, teachers will even be needed to be able to accommodate those who maybe still want to do distance learning versus those who want to come to school. So talking about the budget is a big part of what we're going to be addressing with the superintendent today. Uh, we're waiting for him to join us right now. We're also going to be talking, of course, about distance learning and the digital divide. Uh, we've heard about several uh, tech companies in the area stepping up to donate laptops. But what about Wi-Fi connectivity? I know last time Superintendent uh, Thurman said that there are a million kids in the California school districts uh, that do not have access to Wi-Fi, a million kids. So that's something we'll be talking to him about. Also, a loss of learning for students that maybe haven't been able to fully utilize uh, distance learning over the past few months, and, and maybe they're going to be set back and behind. We'll ask him about whether or not he's going to be encouraging school districts to hold some kids back a grade. Is that fair? Should they be doing that? And what will that look like come the fall? And also, of course, parent and student wellness. This is Mental Health Awareness Month, and so we'll be talking about the mental, uh, the safety this has really taken the toll, excuse me, this has really taken on uh, our the mental health of both students and teachers and faculty across uh, California school districts. So those are just some of the topics we're going to be talking about with uh, him today. This is Superintendent Tony Thurman. We are awaiting him uh, right now. He's going to join us any minute at this time. So please do submit your questions. We are live on Facebook right now. We are live on YouTube and uh, you also can submit them on Instagram. So uh, as we await Superintendent, uh, Superintendent Thurman, I do want to share an interview with you that happened earlier today on Midday Live. It's one of the more popular bars in San Francisco that I'm sure you had to uh, hear about, I'm sure you've heard about, that had to shut down. Take a listen. I'm sure that there are a lot of you out there who were totally bummed out when you heard that San Francisco's oldest LGBTQ bar was closing. Of course, we're talking about the stud. One of its owners is joining me right now. It's an honor to talk to you, Honey Mahogany. Hi, Reggie. Thanks for having me. Okay, so the stud, definitely one of my faves in San Francisco. So many people feel the same way, 55 year legacy. And unfortunately, COVID-19 just uh, didn't allow the stud to hang on. What happened? Yeah, I mean, we have been trying to keep the stud alive for three years now, me being the collective and my co-owners. We took over three years ago when the stud was originally threatened with closure. Um, but uh, we kept it alive and we knew it wasn't going to be our forever home and we were looking for our forever home and we you know, thought we had found a place and then COVID-19 happened and all of our income dried up and we still had to pay rent. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we could not continue to incur that type of debt knowing that one day we do want to reopen the bar. And our, our landlord was kind enough to let us out of our lease early so that we could really save that money and make that happen. And that is the same choice that so many bars right now in San Francisco are facing if they're going to be able to hold on and hopefully get to a point where they can be profitable again. But that is just looking more and more unlikely as these weeks and months drag on. Yeah, you know, we completely understand the stay at home orders and we absolutely think that the public should be taking this seriously. Um, but, you know, we can't deny that it's had uh, a lasting impact on our economy and especially for us businesses that, you know, 
basically are places for people to congregate. I mean, that's what the stud is. It's a, it's a place for people to meet each other. It's a, a lot of people's second home. For venues like ours, you know, there's no sort of end in sight. I mean, we don't know if it's going to be, if we're going to be able to open up in the next three months or six months. And we don't know what, you know, that situation will look like. Will we be able to have people at full capacity? Probably not. You know, we're a small venue. Uh, the fact is that rents in San Francisco are extremely high and, and our profit margins are razor thin, you know? So it, uh, it really dealt us a blow at a time where we couldn't afford to take one. And I think that many other small businesses, especially bars and uh, nightclub venues will, uh, you know, probably be in the same position. But like the phoenix that rises again and again, the stud, while it's holding a funeral for this spot, hopefully it won't be out for long. How do you envision the stud coming back? Yeah, I mean, I want to be clear because I think that there has been like a, a real, um, you know, people don't want to see the stud close and, and, and want to make, you know, say like, oh, everything's going to be okay and we'll be back. And while we hope to do that, there's no lease in hand. We don't have a contract. We don't have any idea when we'll be able to reopen. And it's going to take a lot of money in order for that to happen. You know, we've been looking at estimates for the last three years. It's going to cost around $700,000 for us to find a new place. And we're just members of the community without that kind of cash. So, um, you know, once we do reopen, we hope we definitely want to be a place that has a stage. Um, we definitely want to keep that same authentic old school San Francisco vibe. We want to um, keep it so that everyone continues to feel welcome. And it, again, feels like other people's second homes, you know, like they're coming home into a space, a place where, you know, they kind of know everybody, um, where people can be free to be themselves and uh, really have a good time on the dance floor or in front of our stage. Yes, that's so important because the stud has always been, and I hope will continue to be, a place that welcome absolutely everybody, that's no right. matter you know, what flag you fly. So um, I'm glad to hear that there is some hope. I do want to end this on a positive note. And as I'm sure you're well aware, as a former RuPaul Drag Race girl from season five, that we're about to have the finale for season 12. So who's your girl? You Honey know, Mahogany. Oh my gosh. I'm, well, I have to say Crystal Method. I mean, yes. she to me is... Uh, something we haven't quite seen before. I mean, we have had, you know, quirky queens or whatever, but she is just a unique character. She's so full of joy. And honestly, her trajectory has been utterly inspiring. And she reminds me of home. She reminds me of the stud. So, you know, Crystal Method is my girl. I think all the ladies are completely amazing and fabulous. It's an incredibly talented season. We'll see if Rue agrees with me. It's been an, an awesome season. And it has kept a smile on so many of our faces during a really hard time. Honey Mahogany, I can't wait for the stud in whatever form to come back, and I'm glad that you and I are both on the same team as far as RuPaul's. Oh, you're generation. Crystal Method as well. I am Team Crystal Method, my friend. <laughs> I knew I liked you. I knew I liked you. All right. Well, thank you for having me, and remember, we have the stud funeral on May 31st at 6 p.m. Tune in. Um, you can also check out our website. We have plenty of cool merch. Um, we're just going to be raising money until we can finally find our forever home, so you know, hang in there with us, and you, we hope to see you along the way. I'm ordering merch as soon as the show's done. Honey, thank you so much, and we will be right back. All right, that was a great conversation. I know we are standing by for California State Superintendent Tony Thurman, and so many of you are joining us and sending us your questions. We're having just a little bit of a technical issue uh, having him join us here over Zoom. That's what happens right now as we're all doing these uh, digital uh, interviews right now. So we're just going to take a quick break on air. We are still Facebook on Facebook Live and streaming live. We're connecting with him now, and we'll have him join us hopefully when we get back. So just stick with us. Thank you.
All right, welcome back. As we await Superintendent Tony Thurman, we want to show you this uh, other reporting we've been doing on this different kind of Memorial Day today as the country, of course, is in the middle of a pandemic. A lot of services to honor fallen heroes have gone virtual, but as ABC's Andrew Deinbert shows us, the message does remain the same. On this historic Memorial Day, Americans paying tribute not only to those who made the ultimate sacrifice serving this country. We're going to give it our best shot to honor all of our fallen veterans. But to the almost 100,000 lives lost to COVID-19. With the COVID-19, everything is being canceled. Uh, not to show any kind of respect to our fallen brothers and sisters is not the right thing to do. Department of Veteran Affairs says over a thousand COVID-19 deaths in this country were military veterans. President Trump paying tribute at Arlington National Cemetery in a wreath laying ceremony for all the nation's fallen heroes. With social distancing guidelines in place, the cemetery open only for families and officials with a special pass to visit graves. For everyone else, virtual tours were available online. There's a big white house, it's on it. The nation's annual Memorial Day concert from Washington, D.C. Much of it recorded on the West Lawn of the Capitol as usual, but this time, no audience. And as the country continues to reopen this Memorial Day and beyond, health officials continue to urge caution, laying plans and preparations to slow the spread. We've learned a lot about this virus, but we now need to translate that learning into real change behavior that stays with us so we can continue to drive down the number of cases. Meanwhile, the White House is broadening its travel ban against countries hard hit by the virus, now denying admission to non-U.S. citizens who have recently been to Brazil, currently the hottest infection zone in the world. Andrew Dimbert, ABC News, Washington. All right, we have Superintendent uh, Thurman here. We just can't hear him. It's not uh, on his, his end. It's uh, an issue with just Zoom and just getting it connected. So I just want to be totally transparent uh, about that with all of you who are here to hear uh, this interview. And I want to say to those of you well who are watching and streaming on our Facebook and YouTube platforms, we will continue this conversation there once we do get connected with him. So uh, don't worry, we will make this happen. But for the meantime, stick with us. Thank you all for your patience. We're just going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. All right, welcome back. I do want to apologize again for the technical issue we're having connecting with Superintendent Tony Thurman. I know a lot of people have been submitting their questions and we thank you for that. I am reading all of them. I have a list here of all of them that we will get to, even if we have to go beyond uh, our time here on the broadcast, we'll continue it on Facebook and YouTube. So please uh, stick with us and we thank you for your patience as we work to get this uh, figured out. 
In the meantime, uh, we'll show you some more of our reporting that we've been doing today on this Memorial Day. There is a large group of people who we know are more isolated than ever right now. Introducing them to video chat technology seems like a great solution, but it isn't always easy to accomplish. ABC's Becky Worley has a look at some of the solutions. We met great-grandmother Ruthie Newman last fall. She's an artistic, social, 87-year-old senior who loves her painting lessons and visits from her son, Keith. Hello. But nursing homes so worried about the spread of the coronavirus have stopped all visits. And Ruthie, who isn't very techy, hasn't been able to set up video chatting. Every day is precious. I don't want to miss out on every opportunity um, to be there for my mom. This dilemma of how to connect with older relatives online is playing out across the world. We want a video conference with my mother-in-law in England. So what's the easiest option? You're going to want to find something that's very straightforward, very easy, and you want to meet them on their level. She says if they have a smartphone, the easiest thing is to use FaceTime, if it's an iPhone, or Google Duo for Android phones. Another easy option if they have Facebook installed. There's an app that's called Facebook Messenger Lite. It just kind of eliminates some of the fluffy extra effects and gets down to business by making it really easy. If they have a webcam on their laptop or desktop, both Zoom and Skype have Meet Now options where you email a link and the user doesn't need an account or pre-installed software to join. Hi, Granny. That's what we did with my mother-in-law. She had no oh, problems whatsoever. That's crazy. For Ruthie, her son Keith and I got creative. There are many dedicated video conferencing devices, some targeted just at seniors, but we bought an Amazon Echo Show, which does video chat through the Alexa app on a phone or through another Echo device with a screen. The key is setting up all of the account and Wi-Fi info in advance and then sending it to the nursing home. Keith delivered it and started a video chat with Ruthie. Hi, Mother. How nice to see you today in person rather than uh, on a phone call. They talked about the future. So you were asking about um, plans for Christmas. That would be nice. Just seeing her, giving him peace of mind. For Good Morning America, Becky Worley, ABC News, Sunnyvale, California. All right, uh, I'm smiling because we are back officially now with California State Superintendent Tony Thurman. Uh, Superintendent, thank you so much for joining us and bearing with us as we figure out all these tech challenges. It just goes to show how hard learning over uh, a computer can be. Uh, thank you. It's what everyone in America is going through. Uh, we're happy to be on and uh, talk with you and, uh, and, and your viewers. Thank you so much. And if it's okay, we'll continue a little bit longer past our time. So I know we have a lot of people joining us on Facebook that are really eager uh, to ask you some questions. Um, so of thank course. you. Great. Thank you for joining us. Let's just start right away by getting uh, to the question that everyone is just so curious about, and that is what will classrooms potentially look like when schools can eventually reopen? Yep. You know, the truth of the matter is it will look different across schools. There's no one size fits all. But there are a few things that we think will be common across schools. Um, you know, students will, and staff will have to maintain physical distance even while at school. Um, students and staff may be wearing masks and we expect that there'll be some taking of temperatures as students and staff arrive at school. Uh, we know that this is unlike anything that we've ever experienced, but given everything that we do know about COVID-19, these are the types of precautions that our schools have to take uh, in order to ensure uh, that our students can return to campuses safely. Absolutely. You know, we're getting some questions about social distancing and recess. How will that look? Is that something that you've sort of figured out yet in terms of uh, what that will be like for kids that, you know, take a break and want to run around and play tag with their friends? Um, you know, and that is to be expected. You know, the idea that, you know, that younger students, especially, and even older students, wouldn't be able to have the kind of normal distancing and, and contact seems very unusual to us. But everything that we've learned since March when the impacts of COVID-19 have really become fully known um, has told us that we have to think differently uh, about how we approach school spaces. You know, I can tell you, I've been in touch with a number of child care center directors and it's amazing to hear they have found ways to use the space differently to create the physical distance that's needed. They've been very creative and, and it's kept our kids safe. I've been amazed to know from child care center directors who even use, um, you know, the outside part of our campuses hmm. to sort of broaden the amount of space that we have to work with. And so we know it's a big challenge, but we know that this can be done if everyone works together, um, you know, for safety 
We know that there's also going to be a lot of uh, distance learning that will hmm. still go on. We've heard from our parents who've said they like to have distance learning. Our schools are preparing to have a kind of hybrid model, a blended model, we call it, of some distance learning and some in-class instruction. And to be honest, having that distance learning will actually help us to keep our class sizes on campus small, which we know is important to maintain that physical distancing. When you say that a hybrid, what does that look like? Is that two weeks on in classroom, two weeks off at digital, or is it half the classroom is digital for two weeks, half the classroom is uh, in, in school for two weeks, and they switch? What does that really look like? Yeah, I can tell you what I'm hearing from districts. Obviously, it will vary from district to district. And, uh, you know, right now, school districts are also writing out their plans for how they think their, their classes will be arranged. And so, you know, parents and students to check in with their school districts. What we're doing at the California Department of Education is giving a kind of guidebook on how to open. And here are some of the examples that we hear most commonly. Um, you know, in some cases, um, we think that some schools will open um, where there's instruction every day on campus. But at the same time, uh, for those students and parents who request it, there's also a kind of distance learning, online learning taking place every single day. In other cases, we expect that in order to keep class sizes small, some schools may move to a kind of, a, you know, moving through different sessions. There might be a morning session and there might be an afternoon session. Um, and in other cases, we've heard school districts say they intend to split students in cohorts and students may attend, you know, cohort A may attend Monday and Wednesday, um, and then cohort B may attend Tuesday and Thursday uh, in person. And then on Friday, everyone may participate in some type of hmm. uh, remote learning, distance learning. And so it's going to vary. Um, but what we do know is that there'll be smaller class sizes to keep everybody safe. And what, how does that work with high school? You know, elementary school, for the most part, you keep all the students with the same teacher. But in high school, you might have six periods you go to in one day, six different teachers, and that's one student in several different classes. How will that work? You know, it's very complicated. You know, if, if you follow the guidelines that have just come out from the Center for Disease Control recently, they have floated an idea that the cohort of students may stay together but that teachers might move. And so hmm. there are different scenarios that are being posed. What we're doing is focus testing all the different theories that are coming out by, you know, talking to teachers and others who really know practically what will work and what can't work. We've got a focus group set up on Thursday with teachers. Um, we did a focus group last week with more than 1,000 school superintendents and their staff. We're really pressure testing everything that we're working on and calibrating our ideas with practitioners. We need to hear directly from teachers and superintendents and principals and custodians about what's real. And we're using that to sort of blend it all together in some guidelines that are gonna make sense for our schools and ultimately make sure that we're keeping our students and the, and the staff that serve them safe. Absolutely. And, you know, a lot of questions we're getting are about, okay, if you do have smaller class sizes, does that mean split shifts and then maybe longer hours for teachers? So what is the impact on teachers in a model like this? Obviously, these are conversations that have to take place at the local school district level. They, they, they require some conversation and collaboration by school staff and administration because our calendars are already set. And so now what we're proposing are making some changes to calendars. And those are conversations that have to happen. And, and, and I understand that parents probably feel a little anxiety and have a lot of questions. And that's fair and reasonable. I just want them to know that we'll have answers quickly. Uh, what we're doing is supporting our schools right now. They're literally finishing out the school year. Uh, and for many of our school districts, they're going to finish out in the next week or two. And then they're going to move into a summer period. And so the reality is is that most schools are gonna open in late August or early September the way they normally would. And so for the most part, we have some time for those conversations to play out. But please know that we're working around the clock to answer those questions as soon as possible. And people can contact their local districts. Typically those districts will give updates about what the schedule is gonna look like. Right now, most districts are thinking through their calendars. They're also trying to finish the school year strong for our students. 
and then give a little thought to what the summer is going to look like. Mm -hmm. For many, the summer means a break. Um, you know, educators and students need a little break, uh, you know, in dealing with the fatigue of working through distance learning. But it also means a time for preparing for the oncoming school year and maybe even a time for a little bit of enrichment to give folks a chance to make up a little bit of what they might have missed when our schools move to distance learning. And so um, the, expect that there'll be updates in days and weeks, literally. Um, hmm. But in the meantime, you know, we're wrapping up the school year. I want to acknowledge parents and students um, and educators for their resiliency and how quickly they moved into distance learning in March and, and the hard work um, that they've been doing um, to move forward. I have a feeling it's not gonna be a quiet summer for you, Superintendent, very busy. Um, Krista asks, and a lot of people are asking, of course, about the state budget, which you were here two weeks ago with Kristen, and since then we have gotten the state budget from Governor Newsom, which uh, does, uh, at this point, show some cuts to school districts. So Krista asks, how is the state planning to support local school districts with the increased cost of ensuring student safety in the face of severe budget cuts? Great question, Krista. As you know, um, the state budget has been proposed with some revisions here in the month of May. Um, you know, the governor has some very flexible proposals, but the reality is, is that our economy has really been devastated by the impacts of COVID-19. And our schools depend on revenue that come from people's, you know, from, uh, from income tax and, and, so, and other forms of revenue. And so the amount of revenue that's available for our state is, is really very low. Um, the governor's tried to cushion schools from cuts, but unless something changes in the next few weeks, our schools are going to find themselves being asked to do something that we know they cannot do. They cannot reopen with cuts. And so what we're doing is really putting a lot of, uh, making it known how much support we need from the federal government. And here's a role that everyone can play in California, is to get word to those in the Senate that in fact, we do need a federal stimulus package. It will help those who are out of work, and clearly it will provide resources for our schools. Our schools cannot withstand any cuts. And we also still need to have more computers and internet hotspots for hundreds of thousands of students throughout our state. And so it's very critical that we get that federal support. Uh, in any case, uh, we are having conversations with the members of our legislature, of our legislature about what any revenue measures might look like to help offset any cuts that are currently proposed uh, for our schools. All right, because Mike then actually asked, what is the contingency plan if we don't get that federal money? Uh, you know, we're seeing headlines about it here from EdSource. California districts could pursue teacher layoffs if new state budgets cut K-12 through funding. Is that possible? Thanks, thanks for your question, Mike. I'd like to put you on one of our committees that's looking at <laughs> revenue options. Um, the reality is, Mike and others, is that um, we can't have any cuts. We cannot withstand any cuts. And, and so, uh, as I mentioned, um, we need the federal government to provide that stimulus. If that does not happen, California will have to think about some revenue measures um, that would allow the state to balance its budget and to uh, protect our schools and other sectors. Education is not the only sector impacted, you know, but to protect especially our schools from any kinds of cuts. And we're monitoring what those revenue options might look like. Um, right now, you know, we've got some time and we're watching closely and advocating to get that revenue from the federal government. And so um, we, are, we are pursuing options. We do have an option A, B, and C, Mike, um, but this is, uh, it's like watching a lot of moving trains all at once and trying to yeah. pay attention to critical deadlines. The bottom line for us is we cannot ask our schools to do this without cuts. Absolutely. Uh, no uh, Superintendent, I'm sorry to cut you off, but we are wrapping up our show here, but stick with us because we are gonna continue this interactive show, getting answers on Facebook. We'll be here every day at three. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great day. All right, Superintendent, we're back here on Facebook. We have a lot of people joining us and asking questions, so we're just going to continue uh, if, if you're okay with that sure. yeah, for a few more minutes. Um, great. Yeah. So let's uh, – Anna, I'm going to get to her question from Facebook. She said um, – how is the superintendent addressing students that have, in her words and quotes, disappeared? Uh, as public educators, we are all responsible to support every child, uh, but essentially these, these children that maybe aren't showing up to their digital uh, classes. What, what do we do to support them? Thank you, Anna. Yeah, we're very concerned. You know, there are students who've never really checked in even since we moved to distance learning in March. And so right now I'm, I'm meeting with all the groups that provide counseling 
um, to find ways to help get students connected. We think that there are students whose families are just struggling um, to address basic needs. And, and even though we provide meals to students across 5,000 sites in the state, um, we know that there are many kids who's, who are hungry. Uh, we know that there are thousands of students who are homeless, um, students who are in foster care and have other impacts, and families that maybe just have had to move. And so right now as we speak, we're working with uh, you know, networks and associations of counseling groups to make sure that we have a way to reach these students and their families, connect them to some counseling, provide resources. We ask parents to, and, and educators to really be mindful of how our students are being impacted um, by the COVID-19 um, environment. We know that it's hard on them. They've got questions like us, they're afraid. And, and we've got to make sure that we monitor how our students are doing. Last week, we did a, a forum with students led by students and for students where we shared a number of community resources for counseling and supports for our students. That is a huge priority that we'll keep working on. And I invite people to visit our, our website at the California Department of Education if you need any resources on how to support our students. All right, Jessica's asking, and I think this is going to be something that you might uh, get a lot of questions about over the coming months and year. When this vaccine is ready, will it be mandatory for children to be able to attend school? You know, that's a great question. You know, depending on which health experts you talk to, um, you hear different estimates about when a vaccine could be ready. Some have said a year, some have said 18 months. Um, obviously, we have to, to listen to what the, the, you know, the health experts say about how that vaccine is implemented. Um, you know, obviously, what we also watch is how we are flattening the curve. And, and that is very important. And as the governor has pointed out and health experts have pointed out, what's really important to us is uh, the work we do to flatten the curve. And that means we maintain social distancing and the work that we were able to do with testing and contract, uh, contact tracing. Uh, that's more important than anything right now. Uh, as, as it relates to anything with any kind of uh, vaccine, we'll have to wait and see um, about how that might roll out. But for now, everything that we can do is testing, contact tracing, and continuing to wash our hands and maintain social distancing. Stay tuned. When we have those updates, we'll share them with you. And what about testing? Is anything being done to make sure or see if there could be testing of students and teachers as they come back to school? I know that obviously if we listen to the governor's press briefings every day and he says having tests is really one of the key things we can do to make sure we keep uh, transmission down. So what is being done on that front? You know, California has really led as it relates to increasing uh, testing in very dramatic ways. Thousands of people are being tested now daily. Uh, California is ramping up a program for doing contact tracing so we have a better understanding about who may have been, you know, uh, you know exposed to someone who may have COVID-19 and we're getting that information. There really aren't any details yet as it relates specifically to testing around schools. Right now we know that there'll be some taking of temperatures and we see that happening in our child care centers. We expect that to happen in our K-12 school environments. Um, you know, still more to learn about that's going to how that will happen. And we'll get that advice from our California Department of Public Health um, and from Cal OSHA, which really sets some guidelines around workplace safety. There'll be more information. We'll share it as we have it as it relates to uh, testing in and around schools. All right, and that was actually a question from uh, Anna Marie Booth, who put that on our Facebook page. But then um, Helena chimed in and said, well, what will happen if a student or a staff member does test positive? Will the school shut down? You know, what I can give you examples of what's happening in our schools that are open right now, and that's mostly child care centers. And what they do is they do testing at the school site. They've also asked family members to test um, before their kids come to school. And what they've done is they've essentially created a way to say if your child has a temperature or is ill um, to keep them home. Um, so much, not so much about closing schools down, but what, what everyone's trying to do is set up a system of prevention and creating spaces where if someone were to have a fever or a temperature to create a space where that person could be safely um, while there's a way to get figured out to get support uh, to that student. We're doing everything that we can 
to ensure that schools stay open, but that they stay open safely. And so that's why we're asking students to be wearing masks and same for educators and staff. And so we'll keep you posted as those pro protocols um, become more clear. All right, and someone just commented on our Facebook live stream said, no one's talking about high school sports. And I know that's something that's so important to so many people. So I know you talked about with Kristen two weeks ago. Is there any update on whether or not high school sports or after school curricular, uh, extracurriculars like that will be able to continue in the fall? Uh, you know, un unfortunately at this time, um, high school sports and many extracurricular activities have been suspended um, because we simply don't have a way to keep our scholar athletes safe. And, and we're getting more information about that I'm, I'm meeting literally this week um, with the Federation of, of, of Sports and Intercollegiate Athletics this week to talk about what the future might look like, about when it's safe uh, for our athletes to return to their sporting activities. For now, I would just encourage students to follow the advice of their coaches. And I know that their coaches have said, continue to, to work out and to stay in shape and to stay healthy um, and be ready or when, uh, when the whistle blows, saying it's okay to get back on the field. For now, we ask our scholar athletes to stay safe and continue to, to follow social distancing guidelines. And what about students uh, who maybe have had a challenging time with distance learning? And is there going to be any kind of test for kids when they come back in the fall? And then potentially, would you encourage school districts to hold kids back a grade? Or do you think everyone should move forward? What are the conversations around that? You know, I think it's going to look very similar to what would normally happen, although the circumstances are different. Every school year, our incredible teachers lead the way on doing assessment about where a student enters that grade. Um, and those are our leaders as it relates to doing assessment. A teacher will assess how a student enters on grade level. And then that teacher will put together a plan and some recommendations for how to support that student and to see if they need to uh, have some additional support or some additional enrichment. The reality is, it, I, I know that sometimes distance learning has been bumpy. We acknowledge that. Not all students have computers and some have had to wait to get a paper packet. The reality is, is that our students are always learning, even when it seems like there's some sort of uneven, um, you know, in terms of what it looks like from one school to the next. Um, our students are always learning and our teachers will assess uh, how our students enter um, into their next grade and what support they'll need. I wanted to say at the same time, we are proactively having conversations with educational leaders across the state and across the country about how to make sure instruction looks the same across school sites. Mm -hmm. A lot of that has to do with providing training um, to our educators, um, making sure that students have access to a computer at home. Uh, you know, we're really going to spend a lot of time talking about how does education look different as a result of COVID-19, meaning more focus on mastery of the subject matter and of the content may prove to be more important than how much time a student is actually sitting in a seat or sitting in front of a computer. We want to get to the point where we can show that our students are mastering the content and they can show us that they have, they can apply the learning, um, which, which are the things that we should have been doing anyway. And I think our system has been trying to. COVID-19 forces us to continue in that direction and to do more there. Very well said. We could go on and on and on, but I'm told we have to wrap it up now. I want to thank you so much, Superintendent, for joining us today and being so transparent and answering all these questions. I think you're joining us later this week as well. We have an education town hall coming up, so everyone can also hop on there and, and continue asking those questions. Thank you again. I know you have a very hard job ahead of you, uh, but we appreciate all you do, and thank you for joining us, especially on We're this We're glad topic. to be helpful to Californians, and um, we look forward to uh, continuing the conversation. Stay safe and be well. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. Thank you to all of those who stuck with us watching here on Facebook and submitted your ideas and questions. We tried to get as many uh, as we uh, could answered. So thank you for watching. And again, like I said, Superintendent Thurman will be joining us again later this week for our town hall and education. So you can uh, join us then as well. Thank you all. Have a great day and stay safe.